All righty, we have a new lecture, one that I had already prepared. Now, this one looks a little bit too easy, too short. If uh, we actually copy the text out of the prior lecture, if we actually copy the programming code from the prior lecture, or if we have to type it in, that takes too long. But uh, you can always pause the recording and type it in if you have to do that. But here are the instructions for this one. And so what I'm thinking is that we'll tackle this one, but then we're probably going to... Uh, let's open up here. Go ahead and grab the instructions for C Sharp Tutorial D. I wish I had made this copy and pasteable, rather than just type it in. But it's the same code that we used in the previous assignment, so we could go and find our .cs file and use that. It's really not that much typing, though. And maybe uh, you... Yeah, why don't we just race and type it? So what we're going to do is if we took this code from the other project, what it was is a WPF application that pulled some text out of a text field and then it parsed it and then it displayed an output after it squared it and it used message box to show it. So why don't we get all that working, but let's just change it as we on the fly as we go rather than, you know, type in sin equals textbox.text. .text. We'll go ahead and get the input, you know, the console.read line. So, new project. C sharp. Not a WPF. This is going to be a console app. I'm going to give this one the clever name of lecture. Are we on D or? We were slightly faster than that, slightly beyond that. Did we already done a lecture D? Why? Oh, it's lecture. I'm confusing myself. I guess I already have a lecture D. Oh, probably because I'm using the same computer for C++. So, apologize for that momentary confusion. I'm going to call mine lecture D C sharp. You don't have to do that. I'm just having conflict here between lessons, between the C++ and the C Sharp class. Okay. So if we went back to our instructions, here's what we would be trying to do. That's the wrong one. We want a program that takes some input reads it in a string, S-I-N, converts it to a double, does a square, which goes into that double, and stores it in S-out. This is just the very last lecture, so that will seem very similar. And all the code up here is create a new one, you know, edit the program file that you copied from the last one, get this code in it. So we're just going to make a few changes. What are we going to change? We're not going to use sn is equal to text input dot text. We're going to use console dot, you know, console dot read. And down in here, we're not going to use message box, although we could. We've learned how to do that. Instead, we're going to use console dot write for there, for the message box, and for there. Because if you recall, that is how we set the contents of the WPF text field, is we set dot content. But instead, we just want to display it to the console. So I'm going to need two strings, one an input string and one an output string. So string s in, comma, s out. I'm going to need two doubles, double d-i-n and d-o-u-t. We need to ask the user to give us a value. So console.write line, or just write. Enter a value to square. And we're going to use console.readline. Console.readline. It returns a string, and so we're going to do sin is equal to console.readline. Hopefully it's a number. So we're going to try to parse it. So we're going to use the try parse method. I'm going to sneak a peek at my instructions to remind myself of the syntax. So 
If you recall, what triparse does is you pass in the string, and then as an output field, you pass in where you want it to be stored, the result, but you store its return value in a Boolean variable that you can check. And if you get a successful value, you can do something with it, else you don't you display an error message. So, double dot, or wait, yeah, bool. Okay, is equal to double dot try parse parentheses sin because that's a string, and the output variable of the function is din, right? String sin is the input string, din is what we want to store it as. Do read the chapter as well because I'm not exactly following 100% of what's in the chapter. Maybe we'll go and flip to the PowerPoint after we're done with this and we'll take some work there. Uh, I want to do the chapter justice. These were created to coincide with them, but then the book version has changed seven times since then. So who knows? Let's, we have parsed it. Let's find out if it's successful. If okay, in other words, if parsing was successful. I'm going to monkey with the, uh, the flow of this a little bit and make it if not okay so I can handle my error message first. If not okay, if so, if parsing was not successful, let's create our error. Why am I changing it when I could just be following this exactly? S out is equal to invalid format. Input must be a number. Okay, so string out is equal to invalid data. Your value must be a no number. And then else, after our closed curly brace, some good data. So let's calculate the square, d out, double out. Our result is equal to dn times dn. It's probably the conversion I used, unless I use some exponent function. Nope, that's exactly how I did it there. And now we're going to create our output string. And I bet we use string.format. Something to that effect. Let's take a look. Yep, string.format, and we use these placeholders. Whatever squared is whatever. So, s out equals caps string.format. Suddenly I'm curious about something. String.format, lowercase. Or is there any difference between lowercase string and uppercase string? Did I use uppercase strings throughout my example code? Nope. All right, I'm going to use lowercase. I'm going to have to look into what the uppercase S is. Sorry, I just walked out of a Java class, so I had uppercase S string on my mind. So S out is equal to string.format, parentheses, and let's give a placeholder for the first value. Curly brace, zero, in brace, squared equals curly brace 1 in curly brace, end quote, comma, din, comma, d out, end parentheses, in semicolon. And I just broke it up into two lines for the obvious reasons. Screen real estate. I could probably put it all in one line. All right, we have an output string. So let's close our else clause, our else block, and let's display it with a right line. Console dot right line s out. Parentheses, s out, in parentheses, semicolon. And 
now when we run it, it's going to work. There were build errors. So I need to check my error list. Oh, I have s.format down here as well. That was my mistake. Hopefully you don't. I'm going to zoom out so I can get all my code on the screen. And I'm going to add a few comments. Where's the beginning of my method? It's right here. So I'm going to scroll down to the here and put, looks like I have too many close braces, in main method. All right. Zoom out, see if we like the way that looks. I think so. Try building it again. And there we go. Enter a value of square. 10.1. And I didn't get to see the output. How do we fix that? Go to read key, read line at the very end. Read key. Press any key to exit. All right. So, last thing. Console dot out. Excuse me. Console dot right line. Press any key to exit. Console dot right line quote. Press a key to exit. End quote. End parentheses. Semicolon. And then console dot read key. Capital R. Capital K. Our value is square. 100.1. 1. 100.1 squared. I forgot a D. Equals 102.01. And I believe that. And that was actually the end of the assignment. So I must have planned on lecturing from the PowerPoints for the duration of this. We'll see about that. But let's keep the program open. So did it work for you? Yep. All right. If you can't get this to work, you can look in the notes, of course, and you'll see the finished program most likely. That doesn't mean that I just want you to get in the habit of going and copying what's in the notes and pasting. Okay. So what this is going on about, and you may have learned this from other classes, is that if you use arithmetic, arithmetic operators, binary operators like addition and subtraction and multiplication, binary operator not meaning zeros and ones, but it means it requires two operands like x plus y or 3 minus 2, they have to be of the same data type for the computer to do it. Our program doesn't have to make them of the same data type, but the compiler will convert it to code that forces them to be of the same data type. So, in our code, if we wanted to double that value for some reason, the value of d, d out, like this, I'm just, this is just example code, it's not really, okay, changes not false, right, press key to enter. So for example, here, the rest of this after the read key is gonna be just our play time. So d out is equal to d out star two, or d i n star two, something like that. We're just gonna double it. This is a double. This is an int. They have to be of the same type in order for the multiplication to happen. So the compiler will handle taking this 2 and converting it to a double. Why would it not convert the double down to an int so that it can multiply them? Because converting from a larger data type to a smaller one or a more accurate one to a less accurate one is bad news. You would lose, you know, like what, do I, what did I type? I typed in 10.1. That was my original value. But if we convert that to an int, it's only going to be 10. So there's a hierarchy involved. Ints, longs, floats, doubles, and C-sharp actually has a zillion different data types that, we, that we've seen, I believe, in, in one of the slides. But this is enough. This is the lowest form. That's a better form. It holds, you know, 8 bytes of data rather than just 4. A float can hold everything that a long can hold and more because it supports exponents and a double is a double wide float. So from least to most, if there's implicit conversion going on, then the lesser data type will be promoted to a greater data type. It will not demote it. Double will not get converted implicitly to an int. Implicit meaning that, you know, it happens automatically provided by the compiler. So DIN doesn't get turned into an int. Instead, 
two gets promoted to be a double. That multiplication happens. The result, since a double times a double is a double, gets passed across the equal sign and stored there. That's almost too much explanation, but you need to be aware of the fact that that conversion will happen if these are of the same data type, not of the same data type. If you're worried about that, if you want to force some conversion to happen, you can do that. You can do explicit conversion, explicit casting. And by the way, the C++ language lets you do demotion as well. If I did this, and I'm probably going to delete it because I'm expecting this to be an error, int i is equal to d-o-u-t. D-o-u-t is a double. i, uh, an 8-byte double, i is a 4-byte integer. Now C would not complain about this. C++ would not complain about it. It would try to copy that in there, and if it didn't fit, well, too bad. We lost some data. We can force that, though. We can force the issue by casting it like that. So what we're saying is take that variable, convert it, cast it, just like metal being, you know, you pour metal into a cast and it makes a new form, into the form of an int. The compiler would otherwise complain about it, but we're telling the compiler, no, we know what we're doing. We're willing to accept the fact that we're going to lose our decimal places and it may be too large or whatever. In the Python programming language, you did this to do a conversion. That syntax is not available to us. It is in C++, but C Sharp is an entirely different beast, just like Java is a different beast and doesn't support that either. So over here, whoops, close our assignment. So C Sharp chooses a unifying type for the result when you're doing arithmetic with dissimilar operands. They will be converted to the type with a higher type precedence. In other words, some books call it promotion. That's called an implicit conversion or an implicit cast because the compiler writes the code to do it. Or, so implicit casting is, if as long as it's a promotion, it's perfectly okay. Here we're taking an int, it can be promoted to a double just fine. So that statement would not be a syntax error. But if you wanted to do the reverse, it would be, because a double is 8 bytes floating point, and int is a 4 byte floating non-floating point. It cannot be implicitly converted, so you have to explicitly cast it. So the care data type holds any single character. When you're using a character, you use single quotes rather than double quotes. That's common for a lot of languages, such as Java and C and C++, and however in Python, you just use double quotes or single quotes, whatever you're feeling that day, but they're not interchangeable in these other languages. Note that if you store something as a character, it's not a math value. This is a nine in ASCII or Unicode. It's not a nine that you can do math with. You can't do nine times two if one of them is quotes and get 18. Here we, or we could try that. If I go in here and I do, you know, and z is equal to i times, you know, a 9, like that, or if I store it in a character value, it's not giving me an error, but it's not going to be the result that I expect. So if I console.write it, placeholder, zero in placeholder, quote, comma, z. And I'm going to move my read key down to the very bottom. All right, so if I run it, nine times i, well, what did i equal? You know what, I'm going to throw a fit if this actually worked. Let, let's uh, expand this with a whole bunch of placeholders. That times that equals that. So i times a 9, which I should have stored in a variable to make it easy to print, times z. Now let's see what our output there is. Five. All right. So. 
10 times 9 is equal to 570. Really? No. What's going on there? Well, for one thing, if we look up the ASCII value of 9, it's going to be 57, the number 57. And so it's using the ASCII value. If you know what an ASCII value is, great. Hopefully in one of your other programming courses, you've been introduced to the concept. So if I look up what a numeric 9 is, it's a 57. And so when we multiply 10 by it, we didn't get 90. 9 times 10, we got 10 times 57. That's why we got 570 there. So in order to use this for math, we would have to parse it. We'd use a triparse on it, I would expect. Just like you do with a string. Okay, so an escape sequence. If we've used backslash n, we've already used escape sequences. There are a whole bunch of others. Backslash a, alert. That usually rings the bell on a system that supports making a beep. I'm not sure if these do or not. You could try it. Print something out with a backslash a. Backslash b, backspace. You know, back in the olden days when you uh, hooked up to a computer with a printer, right? That's all you had was like a scrolling typewriter and a printer. It could display some things, and then it could backspace, and then it could type some more. Like if you needed to underscore some data, you'd write your data, you know, you'd write your word, and then you'd backspace five times, and then you'd put some underscores in it, and just like you did on a manual typewriter back whenever. And we don't need to use that too much anymore. Form feeds is kind of the same as a new line, but slightly different. I'm not going to mess with the discussion of those two. We're going to use slash n. Slash r means character term. Wait. I cannot believe that I just flipped out on what a form feed is. It's a page break. Would separate pages. Now on a visual screen, is that going to do anything? Well, let's find out. Let's just experiment a little bit. I'm going to print a form feed here, a backslash f. Yeah, I know. Changes cannot happen while the program is running. I actually appreciate that error message. So I'm going to put a backslash f there to do a form feed before it prints out this second message, just to see what it looks like. Enter a value for... It didn't do a darn thing, right? I'm not using a printer. I'm just using a console app. And so we get this funky little symbol, right? Like Greek symbol for male, you know, kind of like princess symbol. Nobody knows what that is. Okay, so anyways, the escape sequences, the ones that you would use most often or that are the most useful to you are the new line, slash n, tab is useful, backslash t, and being able to put in double and single quotes. Why do you want to do that? Because what if you wanted to print out the message? My name is, quote, slim, end quote, end quote. So, you know, if that was going to be my output string, S out is equal to my name is, quote. This has got all sorts of problems, right? It's got a double quote there. It's got a double quote there. So it's expecting that these four characters, you know, it thinks that the end of the string is there. But we wanted the whole thing to be the string. But we can use backslashes to trick it to convince it that that's not really an end of string marker. So backslash quote, and then after the M, another backslash quote, and there we go. We could print that out and it would look good. Again, I'm going to put this above the console.write line, like that, and then console.write line, S out, just so I can see, make sure that I understand what that's supposed to look like. I need to increase the font size. A little momentum. All right, inner value squared, whatever. All right, and then print it out. My name is Slim. If we didn't like the double quotes, we could use apostrophes around it instead, right? You could put, you know, like that. Now, honestly, if you were going to use apostrophes, you wouldn't need to use escape sequences, right? Because they don't terminate a string. So we could get rid of that. But, the reason you would want to do that is what if you had a character 
and you want to set it equal to an apostrophe, right? Well, that looks ridiculous. We have apostrophe, apostrophe, apostrophe. That won't work. So we have to convince the compiler that no, that's not an end of character terminator. It really is an apostrophe. So by putting the backslash in front of it, it tells the compiler, yeah, that is our apostrophe. So you use backslash double quote if you're trying to embed double quotes inside a string. You use backslash single quote if you're trying to set a character equal to an apostrophe. So characters in C-sharp are actually stored in Unicode, not ASCII. But when I said go hit the ASCII table, the reason why is that the ASCII table was grandfathered into Unicode. So the first 127 values of the Unicode chart are equal to all the ASCII values, just to keep compatibility with the huge amount of text you know, that was already created. And then, you know, at a later point, you get your German characters and your Russian characters and, you know, your Japanese and Chinese and, you know, what, kanjis and whatever, whatever all your different character types are because that's why you have Unicode. Unicode, there are far more human letters out there, you know, in all the languages of the world than can fit comfortably in a single byte, in a single, you know, value of 255 different possibilities. You can imagine that once you start, you know, that there's more than 255 different letters out in all the languages on the planet. So they came out with a two-byte standard, a multi-byte standard, which can hold, you know, far more. It can hold, you know, one of 65,000 different letters. So you can support 65,000 different letters. And I think they've even expanded upon that. But so the number A, the letter A is actually stored as binary like this, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And if we wanted to, we could do this conversion and find out that that's equal to 65. That whole thing is equal to 65. But it's a 16-bit 65. 65 would comfortably fit into an 8-bit value. But like I said, Unicode is stored in 16-bit values. They're difficult to read, so programmers use a shorthand notation called hexadecimal. So instead of writing out 000, 000, 000, 0100, 010, you would convert these bits in your head. And if you took in one of my fundamentals classes, we did this 00. And then what is that? Well, that happens to be that happens to be a 4. And then that happens to be a 1. So the hexadecimal representation of this sequence of bits is that. Now I'm not going to explain it further. If you wanted to enter a hexadecimal code into a string, you can use a slash u escape sequence. And what the slash u escape sequence does is it says that whatever follows that is a series of hexadecimal values. And hexadecimal values are, um, are numbers you know, between 0 and 9, but also they tacked on an additional six digits, which are a, b, c, d, e, and f. I guess we could prove that point. We have this character here. I'm going to set it equal to a hexadecimal value. So I'm going to do backslash u, Unicode value, and then I'm going to go back to my ASCII table here, and I'm going to find out that a pound sign has a hexadecimal value of 2, 3. So if I come back here and I do 0, 0, 2, 3, and then I print that character out, Console dot right line parentheses quote placeholder zero end placeholder end quote comma ch. It should print out that hash symbol. And it did. Now why would you want to do that? Well there are a lot more values out in the world than just our standard hexadecimal values. I'm just going to arbitrarily set this to a larger value. What is, for example, 1, 2, 2, 3 Unicode? I have no idea. Smileys, excuse me, emoticons even have Unicode values. Well, it 
put a question mark. We could play around with that until we got something else. Let's find a Unicode value for O um lot. Small letter O with diuresis is 00F6. Okay, so I'm going to go and change this to 00F6. Now when I print it, I'll print a small O with a symbol. Okay, a U. Sorry, I said O, but it's a U. I guess if we wanted to print out blue oyster cult and put the two dots above the O, like the band does, then we could find the Unicode value for the capital O with the two dots above it. Oh, that's weird. Mine actually made the O, not the U. Oh, really? You're, you're, you gave it a different result? Oh, uh, it's F6. Not oh, it's F6, FC. not FC. Yeah. Okay. As, yeah. All right, now we're going to get the O. Cool. All right. So what is an F7? A divided symbol. That's pretty neat. You can't see this on the screen, can you? I hope all the examples I've shown you have not been cut off at the edge. I haven't checked to see if they're recording. Um, what I'm mumbling about is that the projector that we are projecting on cuts off like a centimeter's worth of screen, and I'm hoping you all to see that. I need to verify that. Anyways, it put a division symbol. That's pretty neat because whenever we do a division, right, we, we've used slash to indicate division. But it's nice to actually have a division symbol available to us. So when you go into the Word formula editor and there's all those symbols available to you, you know, so that you can you know, create mathematical equations or whatever, then each one of those is a Unicode, Unicode value as well. So comparing strings. If you recall, in Java, you cannot use double equals to compare two strings. You may have had that hammered into you if uh, you've taken several Java courses. In C Sharp, just like in C Plus and Python, you can use two equals symbols to compare strings. Or there are methods. You can use the compare method or the equals methods and the compare to methods. But if you can just do that, then why not do that? So a string is considered equal to another one, lexically, based on the values of Unicode. So if you are comparing two values, a, a small a, is considered to be larger than an uppercase a, which may, um, you know, if you sorted all your songs in your iPad, in your iPod, based on that, then all the artist names who began with a capital A would be in a completely different spot than all the artists for the lowercase a. So you would probably want some kind of function that would uh, compare them, ignoring case. That's called a lexical comparison. The letter values are sorted alphabetically. I wonder if C sharp smart enough to not fall into that uppercase, lowercase a trap. I'm not going to find that out. I know that they will be different. If we try to check to see if uppercase A is equal to lowercase A, let's find out. Let's find out. I've got to find out. So, care A1 is equal to single quote uppercase A. Care A2 is equal to single quote lowercase A. If A1 is less than A2, Console dot right line caps are bigger. End quote. Else parentheses console dot right line smalls are bigger. It says that caps are bigger. So C Sharp is, is not using the straight Unicode ASCII values to do the comparisons. Let me make, look at my logic and make sure.
sure that that's the case. No, because I did A1 is less than A2, right? I goofed. This should have been greater than, and it will give me the result that I expected, which is to say that lowercase letters are, are bigger, because A1 is the uppercase. Well, all right. Did I really have to go to all that trouble? I could have just done this if A is greater than A, right? I didn't even need those two characters. I would have proven the point. Now we're going to see smalls are bigger. So the string data type, a string is a sequence of letters, a sequence of characters. So if we want to, if we want to find out what character is at a specific position, or if we want a group of them, that's known as a substring. So if we have this string water, and we call word.substring 0, 1, it's going to be W. What does that mean? Starting at position 0, and hopefully you've already been introduced to the idea of zero-based indexing for strings and lists. That's position 0, that's position 1, that's position 2, that's position 3, that's position 4. So, starting at 0 and going up to but not including 1, that's what that means. That's a W. But if you do 0, 2, starting at position 0 and going up to but not including 2, you get WA. If you start at 2 and go to position 4, that's not one of these here, but starting at 2 and going up to but not 4, it would be TE. If we try to go, why would this produce an error message? All right. I just did you a, a bad. I didn't give you the right information. The first position is the start position, but the second one is not the ending position. I was thinking of another language. I apologize. It's the length. So starting at position 0 and giving you 1, that's a W. Starting at 0 and giving you 2 is WA. Starting at 2 and giving you 3, TER is 3. Then you get TER. Starting at 3 and asking for 4, well, 3, and then 1, 2, and we're past the end of the string. So that produces an error message. So we have a string like this. S out is equal to Darth Vader. But we only want to print out the H and the space and the V. So SIN is equal to S out dot substring. So we're, what is position H? That is character 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So we're going to start at position 4. And how many characters do I want? I want that one, that one, and that one. So that's 3, like that. And so for you guys who came here from Python and you remember slicing, well, this doesn't follow the rules of slicing. You're not specifying a begin position and end position. You're specifying a begin position and how many characters. And I like that. I think that's a great way of handling it. So if we printed out SIN at this point, we would get H space T. I don't think we actually need to do that. You can believe me. So SIN is equal to H space V, like that, due to the substring. So a named constant, if you've taken other programming courses, you know what a constant is, except Python does not support constants. So in the Python class, you may have decided that, you may follow the book recommendation that if something is in uppercase, you consider it a constant. But like the speed of light in meters per second, double C, like E is equal to MC squared, C stands for the speed of light, C is equal to... 3.0 exponent to the 8. That's the speed of light, roughly. Accurate to like 3 or 4 digits of precision. If, 
if the speed of light is not supposed to change in your program, right, you don't want to see somewhere in your code C++ like there and we're adding one to the speed of light. No, speed of light's a constant. So we can go and make it a constant by adding the uh, C-O-N-S-T in front of it. Now C is kind of a bad variable name. Why do I say that? Because we generally want to avoid single letter variable names, even though in E is equal to MC squared, it kind of makes sense in that context. I would give it a better variable name, and since it's a constant, I would probably put it in caps, separated by semicolons, excuse me, underscores, like that. Then when I wanted to calculate E, you know, E is equal to MC squared, so joules is equal to the amount of mass, let's say, 10 kilograms times the speed of light squared. So I need to remember what, how to take something to the exponent in this language. Times speed of light, like that. And then, you know, that's what happens in an atomic bomb, is matter is converted to energy, releasing an incredible amount of joules. So whatever, we get the correct number of joules for converting 10 kilograms to energy. What's the real point of this? This declares it as a constant, meaning that if your code tries to change it later, if we uh, decide to see speed of light plus plus, the compiler's going to flag that as an error. No, you can't do that. Why? Because, well, it gives a not a good answer. The operand of increment or decrement must be a variable, property, or indexer. Well, it is a variable, isn't it? I mean, it's a constant. So, no, we can't do it. I wish I would give it a better error message. A better error message would be you cannot increment a constant, right? So it's kind of a vague error message, but we cannot change it. What I mean by that, the compiler will not allow us to type code that changes it. Now, that doesn't make it super safe, ultra secure, impossible to be hacked. It just prevents you from making a change to that value in your code, unless you go in it, you actually edit the, the the numeric literal there. So when you hear terms like constant or private as opposed to public, it's not that the data is more secure from a hacking point of view. Somebody could still edit your, your code with a sector editor or memory injection or something, and they would probably be able to change the bytes of that value to something else. The fact that we called it a constant doesn't change that. What it does is it tells the compiler that that value should not change. A uh, little bit of a distinction. Let's get rid, rid of that since that's not going to work. Or I could put it back and just put comment that this is an error. Error. Cannot modify a const. So programmers usually name constants using all uppercase letters using underscores. Why? It's easy to understand even without program comments. It's got a good name. If my code just had this, right, 3.0, exponent 8, if we substituted that for that, and don't make this change, I'm just going to immediately undo it, right, like that, then I'm, unless I just happen to recognize what that value is, oh, that's the speed of light, you know, in meters per second. Well, yeah, um, why does anybody know that unless they've ever had a reason to memorize it? So you would have to add a comment, right? E is equal to mc, you know, to the power of 2, where c equals speed of light, right? Then, now we understand what it is. Now, commenting your code like that is not a bad thing. But if it says speed of light, right, that makes the code easier to understand. One of the things you want to avoid is when your comment does not match your code. If you ever go in and change your code, make absolutely sure that your comment is still applicable. And what do I mean by that? What if I had made this mc times 2? That would be deceptive, right? That's not accurate. That's not an accurate representation of that. And so some programmer who came along after you would either need to figure out, they would go, oh, well, why did you do that? It's not, I'm going to fix that. There we go. Right? And they think they fixed it because they made it match the comments. No, in this case, the comment. Yeah, you just need to make sure that you update your comments whenever you update your code. So that's called.
called self-documenting. Self-documenting is when you choose good variable names in order to make your statements clearer to read, rather than just using X and I1 and I2 and I3. So enumeration, this is about where we're going to stop, because I had some homework or another assignment queued up for doing enumeration. But we can type one in. What you're doing when you do enumeration is you're creating a variable type that can be only set to one of a few specific values. Like day of week. We're saying that if we create a day of week variable, that that variable can only be set to one of those seven values. So for example, well, that's not what I want to show. And they don't have a code example of it. We will come back to that idea. We already know this stuff. What is an interactive program? It's one that allows user input. If it's a console application, we will use read line the vast majority of the time. It accepts anything that the keyboard can type. It returns a string. And then you have to convert the string to something else if you want to do math on it. Or you can use substring or whatever to get stuff out of it. Or like what if they type in their whole name and you need to get the first name and the last name. You know, you, you can parse the string in order to get that information out. This is an example of the same kind of stuff that we've been doing. Read line, do a conversion. Note that they're not using try parse. They're using convert to double. Their code is risky because if they typed in a, a string that was not a valid value, like 28.b, this would blow up and it would crash the program because they did not use double dot try parse. That's why I've been illustrating you know, the try parse function rather than the uh, convert class. The convert class sure does have a lot of various versions. You can convert something to a Boolean, you can convert something to a byte, to a care, to an int32. But you can do the same thing with try parse, right? If you need to convert something to an int16, we ought to be, and you don't need to necessarily type this, we ought to be able to type, you know, int16 dot try parse, you know, give it your input and what you want to store it in, right? Something like that, and you want to store, you know, its return value in a Boolean variable so you can see if it worked. Now, this is giving me a complaint because i is not an int 16, which is a short. I would have to declare an int 16 to hold a result if I wanted to do that, if I wanted to parse a string to be a 16-bit value. Oh, and I'm still getting errors. OK, fine, I'll make it a short. I forgot the word out. Okay, that was the real problem. Short and int 16 should be synonyms for each other because a short is a two byte value. It holds less than an int, which is a four byte value. So, anyways, don't use convert as the textbook illustrates convert.toCare, convert to you know to int 16 or whatever. Instead use try parse. Use care.try parse or int 16.try parse. It's safer. Now if you're absolutely a thousand percent sure that the conversion will never fail, you know, whatever, you can skip it. So using the parse methods, here we go. This is an alternative to the convert class. Parsing a string turns it into its numeric equivalent. Oh, and they don't give an example of that either. All right, the PowerPoint is pretty poor in examples, so it's a good thing we do our lecture. I'm not going to use a parse method. I'm not going to illustrate that because it's got the same problem. Instead, I would use try parse. Always use try parse. How's that? Oh, how's that for a recommendation? All right, our summary. We have a lot of different integral data types. S means signed. U means unsigned. An unsigned one can hold twice as large a value but cannot hold a negative value. That's the difference between an unsigned int and an int. You Java folks have never seen an unsigned data type before. Same for you Python guys. But C++ and C Sharp and C 
follow that paradigm. You have three floating point types, float, double, and decimal. Decimal is the most accurate, so you'd want to use it for storing people's money and stuff like that. You know, and doubles are pretty darn accurate, so I'd, I'd like to read up an explanation of how more, much more accurate decimals are. You can use the binary arithmetic operators, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and modulus. I hope you know what modulus means by this point. If you've taken other programming classes, it means remainder of. So if you do this, 5 modulus 2, you know, x is equal to 5 modulus 2, or x, whatever. This means 2 goes into 5 how many times? Well, 2. But what's the remainder? 1. Right, because 2 goes into 5 2 times, and then 2 times 2 is 4, you get a remainder of 1. Right, and if this is a 6, and we mod it by 3, 6 modulus 3, 3 goes into 6 how many times? Twice. But it goes in evenly, with no remainder, so x would equal 0. And read up on modulus if you don't understand it. So you have shortcut arithmetic operators, plus equals, minus equals, so you can do x plus equals 1. Python folks are very familiar with that. This language, like Java and the other C-based languages, also supports that as your increment and your decrement. But you can't just do that in order to add 10 to it. X plus equals 10, right? What that does is it takes the value of X, adds 10 to it, and stores it back into X. Boolean is another data type that can only equal true or false. You can store flags in it. What are flags? Flags are the results of calculations that you can check later. Like if we did this, bool too big is equal to i to greater than 100, right? This is a Boolean expression that would return true or false. We're storing the result of that in a flag called too big. So later on, we could do if too big, do something. Whatever we were going to do, print an error message out or something, I don't know. You know, round it down to set it equal to 100. Something like that, right? So a Boolean variable that's used to drive a decision later on is known as a flag. It's kind of a colloquial term, but you'll hear it an awful lot. Read line accepts user input. Read key will read in a single character. You could ask the user to hit a single character, and you could store the result in a care variable, and you could inspect it if you needed to. And we are done with Chapter 2. Let's see what homework we had queued up. So here's the homework assignment for it. It's going to be a console application. What it's going to ask for is two values, x and y. Store these in double variables. Your program will multiply the values together and display the results. So if they enter 10 and 3, it will display 10 times 3 equals 30. Then please use double.tryparse to ensure the program doesn't crash. Don't let them get away with crashing. Once your program supports multiplication, modify it to support addition, subtraction, division, and modulus as well. All right. Hope that makes sense. Please contact me if you have any questions.